Hello, everybody. I think I'll go ahead and get started as the last people come into the room because I do believe that I'm the last presentation in this room tonight, and I'm preventing you from getting a good drink and some social time. Um, my name is Rebecca Daniels, and I work for CSL Bearing, and I'm here to talk about our identity and access management journey. For those of you who don't know what, C what CSL Bearing is, we are a pharmaceutical company. We manufacture um, pharmaceuticals mostly for um, rare condition, and a lot of what goes into the manufacturing of our um, pharmaceuticals is plasma. And, um, so what I'm going to talk about is our journey, where we, where we were, um, what we've accomplished, and what we learned along the way, and where we're going from here. Um, I came to work for CSL Bearing in 2017 in February. The weekend, the Monday after the weekend, they implemented our uh, identity and access management system. And um, so what I stepped into was um, some, some learning that I needed to do. I had a very small team. We were still working with a vendor. And one of the things that we needed to do was um, continue to implement our system with some, uh, some additional efficiencies. Our original business case was presented in 2014 before uh, my time with the company. And it was an audit event. And like many people who have implemented an identity and access management system for the first time, a lot of what precipitates the implementation is generally an internal audit that wants you to do a better job at managing your separation of identities and getting rid of access. Um, we were a small company. Um, originally, when uh, in around the 2014 2015 time period, we were about 15,000 identities, and that constituted a, a good amount of our employees and our contingent workers. And uh, from, the, from that time till about now, we've moved to about 39 to 40,000 identities because we're growing rapidly. We grow about 15% in our employee base every year. But we also, because of, because of that growth, we also have to put, bring in a lot of contingent workers to help with the implementation of different technologies across the enterprise. So our original audit finding was that we needed to streamline onboarding and offboarding. The original business case focused on onboarding identities so that we could reduce the manual effort that was required to create identities for some base set of services. So when you're looking at Active Directory accounts, mail, home drives, um, Skype, and those set of services that are typically what most people need when they're accessing an enterprise, that was the original business objective. And also to be able to terminate those identities so that they couldn't um, access the network once they left, the, left their relationship with us. Um, and so that, so as part of that finding, right before they stood up the system, um, they implemented a stopgap solution that we then needed to slowly start to replace. So after we implemented in February, our implementation continued through the end of that year. And I'll talk a little bit about what are some of the things that we do. Um, so typical joiner mover lever, um, we're we focus, like I said, right now we still focus on um, doing the traditional base set of services that employees and contingent workers need to do their job, although from, for the work that I'm doing now, that work is expanding. Um, and we do it through our integration with our Workday as our HR system. That's what our employees and our contingent workers come from. Now, that's not all of our identities. We have managed service providers that don't th go through that channel, and we have external partners that don't go through that channel. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in the next year to accommodate that, those set of services from into our environment to access different systems that they need. We also have partner companies that we have a relationship with, but they're either, um, they're not CSL bearing, but they we own them and we share 
systems with them and they have their own set of services. And so some of the things that we don't do here, you won't see transfers across um, like large enterprise spaces because we aren't doing that except with updates. And when you look at it, company codes, um, we have company code moves and we have call center code moves. So we take care of those in the updates and the transitions and that we have to update different security group memberships and we have to onboard and offboard different systems based on that. But that's what we're doing right now. And then we also take care of other identity updates. And then we handle terminations, uh, leaves of absence, and returns from leaves. And mostly we center on um, the relationship and the data that we get from Workday. And um, we do a lot of the work with Active Directory, but we also have to do some provisioning to some other systems. Um, when I came previous to coming to CSL Bearing, I worked as a service provider in a large company. And one of the things that I had done as part of that company was develop a methodology for how to focus on identity management. And as part of that practice, um, we came up with sort of a quadrant-based approach so you could focus what you wanted to accomplish in a given space. And, and so I've carried that with me into this environment because um, for like, those practitioners in here that are like me, um, in order for you to really understand a business need and how to put that into technology, you kind of need to focus your attention on that space. So it's, we divided it up into four primary quadrants, and in each of those quadrants, it deals with large process groups that get, they move down to process threads, that moves down to data, and that is ad addressed by different technologies. So we have a, an assortment of technologies that accomplish different business objectives based on the space that it's in. And, um, and an, one other thing that I needed to bring to CSL Bearing was this concept that while we had an implementation project, it was, we needed to instill in everyone that it was a program and that in order for the program to be successful over time, it needed to be something that, that um, matured as, as services come and go, as systems come and go, and as our, as our um, environment grows. So this is just a drill down to show you that when you take a look at these different sets of services, you can focus on identity management, and that truly is just identity. And the identity attributes, where the person lives, um, how they move across the organization, and all the data that's related to that particular identity. Where the source of record is, whether or not you have to do additional assurances to um, prove that this person um, needs these access to services, or you can prove the validity of the data that's being presented. And then you have the access management services, and these typically deal with like provisioning, deprovisioning, deals with access control and roles, um, attribute-based access control, et cetera. And then um, when you take a look at the authentication and credential management, this takes a look at how you authenticate the user. Um, what you need in terms of that application, um, whether or not they have an existing session, um, or whether you need to, um, based on where you're going, whether you need to do a step up authentication. And then um, the other services, audit and governance management, and um, all the certifications that you need to do, what frequency, what's the risk of the identity based on the access that they have. And so one of the things I always say when I'm trying to explain this uh, wheel is that even though you can take a focus of one of the areas and take a look at it in depth, it doesn't exist by itself. It, there are things that you have to know, like if you're going to do a, a certification campaign, you need to know what access that person has, whether or not that their access that they're granted is risky or it's too much access and that could precipitate a need for a certification of that individual. And also, if you need to do a recertification, has this person transitioned from one organization unit to another and then that might spawn the need for a certification campaign. Um, and so then this is just a little bit more detail um, that you could see. And, and given, 
depending on how mature you are, and I would like to say that we're probably in the, when you look at being born and raising your head, and then crawling, walking, running. We're probably a toddler right now because um, our identity management system is two years old. Um, and before that, we didn't have an identity management system. And in fact, we didn't have a security organization. So my boss, who's the CISO, was the first CISO for our organization. And so in terms of security and oversight and individual um, understanding about security and procedure and authentication and the need to authenticate and the need to under understand um, who you are and what you're accessing um, is relatively new for our organization. And we're growing rapidly. And so while we're also improving the systems and implementing it and, get, and have gotten it very stable now and are starting to extend our services into more areas, we're also having to do a lot of OCN. And uh, one of the things that was, I think, new to the business technology organization also was um, this need for organization change management. A lot of security, when you think about it, in general, Security systems tend to sit underneath everything else and monitor and watch what's going on. And a lot of that beyond the authentication and the multi-factor credentials that you need. You typically, that's not typically user facing a lot. And so the first services that they put into our organization tend to center on security. And so there wasn't this need for getting education in front of users. Um, when I entered the organization, it became relatively evident that we needed to do a lot of, a lot of education and maturing the organization to help them understand that while single sign-on services are awesome, they're terrible if you don't take a, if you're not willing to understand and authenticate possibly every 12 hours, or if you move devices, or if you go to a from a relatively insecure system to a more secure system, and we need to step up, authenticate you to get you into that system, that that's important for protecting the data. And mostly, it's important for protecting our patients. Because a lot of the data that we have in our organizational systems is all about the manufacturing of our product, which saves people's lives. And so that's paramount to. Um, some of the things that go into why we implement the things that we implement and why when I go out and I talk about these different services, why it's important for people to understand why we're doing these things. <clears throat> um, this is sort of telling a little bit about where we came from in terms of single sign-on and then where we're going um, with it and where we've come and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit towards the end about where we're going. Um, Applications in CSL prior to our identity and access management implementation tended to exist in their own individual groups and silos. Every, every system was developed as a small application team that really didn't have to talk to any other application team. They onboarded their own accounts. They set up the data repositories. They set up the databases. And everybody that needed access would go through a local service desk to get access. Um, so one of, the, one of our primary objectives, since that we were mostly web-enabled and we were taking on a lot more cloud applications, was to ensure that we had a strategy for pulling what we were doing with the birthright access for mail and Skype and um, just general network services to these cloud um, providers and these cloud applications. So uh, we implemented a single sign-on solution in the cloud with the initial objectives as reducing single sign-on, sign improving user experience, which translates to, I never have to sign on again. That's what I hear. <laughs> so they'll say, why am I being asked to sign on? I'm like, I think your session expired, so just back up and it'll renew. <laughs> and that's why I say that a lot when people ask me what's going on. And then, um, so 
When our initial services went live, we went live with our uh, vendor that helped implement it. In 2017, towards the end of 2017, we had about 18,000 identities in total. That represented all of our contingent workers, a number of external um, providers that access our systems, and our employees. Um, I didn't think that five applications in a two-year period, which was the time when the, it was planned till it was implemented, was a very efficient way to onboard, I didn't, um, to onboard these applications. So I sat down with the team, and we helped define a standard approach for doing it in, ter in terms of um, what types of protocols we'd support, SAML, WS Federation, um, the number of applications, like how would we vet an application, and um, and then I wanted to teach my team how to do it. The team was brand new. Most of them, like I said, we, it was new. They were new in security. They were new in identity management. And a lot of them were new with federation capabilities and systems as well. But we used a cloud. Um, we, you, we used identity now as our initial product. And that was cloud-based. And it was, I, I would say, in terms of the ability to do that and be able to teach a population um, federation services and to get things moving is a, is a pretty good platform um, for what we needed at the time. And so, we, so I taught a couple people how to onboard these applications and set them free and said, here it is, we built it, come, come. If you build it, you know, I just sort of kept saying those principles. I'll take an application that only has 25 users. I'll take an application that has 150 users. I'll take any application that supports SAML, get it on this platform, and we'll onboard it. So between 20, the November 2017 and the end of 2018, we onboarded 40 applications. And this was for folks like uh, fresh out of college that hadn't, hadn't really ever done federated technologies again before. And so they learned very quickly, and we were able to accomplish that. And then um, it's June, July almost. So it's July 2019, and we've onboarded an additional 30, 30, <laughs> approximately 30. I think we have 78 now as of today. I didn't update the, the slides. So. Um, that just sort of shows that when you, when you focus in an area and you talk about the technical initiatives you're willing to support and you talk about the data that you need and the approach, you can really start to get some movement and traction in the organization, even if your application folks that you're facing off with don't understand it as, as well as maybe you do. They, they, they're, willing, uh, they're willing to learn, and, uh, if the, and a lot of these technologies have gotten simple enough that for basic services, it makes it so much easier to onboard. Um, in terms of our identity and access management services, um, we use this as sort of an approach when we're trying to talk to application teams to find out what they need. Um, a number of these I haven't rolled out yet, so I'll talk a little bit about in terms of some of the ones that we don't have yet but that are coming and the ones that we have. So we have full lifecycle life cycle management capabilities in our system now, we use, um, and we're onboarding. We're right now in the, in the right now in, um, implementing version 8.0 in our system and also starting to look at switching out our single sign-on services um, to a new provider and uh, addressing some additional business objectives that we need. We have those services um, fully um, vetted. We understand how to take care of them. And so when we go to collect requirements from an application, it really, it really falls down to what are the roles how can we group the roles? What data do you need um, for us to manage? And we can collect that a lot more easily than we could about a year ago. Um, for Compliance Manager, we are, we're Australia-based company, so we don't have SOX compliance certifications that we have to do, but we do have a lot of certifications that we have to do with our ERP systems. And also because we're labeled a GXP application, and for those of you who are not in the pharmaceutical 
manufacturing business. GXP just means good something practice. So good clinical practice, good manufacturing practice, good engineering practice, et cetera. You just plug in the um, acronym in the middle to fit. And um, my system is a GXP application. Um, it got rated GXP application because while I'm not provisioning a lot of manufacturing systems today, I will be by the end of this year. And so we needed to make sure that we had stable engineering processes in place so that we could meet the regulatory compliance needs that were required for manufacturing. Um, so for policy management and policy enforcement, we are starting to, to look at doing a lot more of that. We have to integrate with, um, with uh, some of the SAP systems. We're taking on some of their GRC policies. Um, and so what we're going to leverage is, um, we're probably going to leverage and take a look at the, some of the things that are being built in the GRC module for CellPoint. That's one of the things that we're looking at doing. And I think I have four minutes left and about 10 more slides. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we had to define, we defined our single sign-on services as authentication broker services. That's where password management is done. This is really important for the external parties that access our services. They're coming in from the outside, and in order for them to be able to um, update a password in a self-service way without, getting, without having intervention is they need to have a cloud-based service to do that. And so we're doing that. And then we, um, I'm also responsible for privileged access management in the organization. So I don't only do typical identity lifecycle management and single sign-on services. I'm also responsible for multi-factor authentication. And, uh, and I'm responsible for privileged access management security. So we stood that up uh, this year um, using a CyberArk privilege access management, and we've rolled that out across all of our Wintel privileged accounts, all of our Linux and um, Unix accounts, and we're starting on our service accounts and on our database accounts uh, right now. And then on top of that, I had to create an operational organization that could support um, us So as, as we go. And so when we implemented, I started February 7th, 2017. We implemented that day. We, there were almost no identities getting provisioned. We had so many errors, and that's because change management didn't exist in our organization. There wasn't a lot of good cooperation across the towers. So people were changing services and infrastructure moving H drives and storage file share servers to different locations, decommissioning servers that we had done testing on, and um, they weren't there anymore. And so we were having a hard time provisioning. Um, between February 2017 and October 2018, we went from having about 180 to 190 incidents a month to 40. And my, our last report that we just got was about 20. And about, still about 50% of those are from upstream problems being entered in Workday. So that's just sort of like when you talk about where we've come, um, this slide just sort of overviews that we've stabilized our services, we've strengthened the foundation, we have an enterprise-wide solution that now we can take into manufacturing. So by the end of this year, I'll be provisioning accounts for manufacturing, which has a zero downtime, my service level for that is that if somebody can't log in in less than 30 seconds, I can kill a batch. And that batch can translate to millions of dollars. And so for us to be able to do that, we have to make sure that our services are reliable. And for those of you who know that um, when you're looking at a service, the best way to know if your service is reliable besides uptime availability is uh, taking a look at your overall service metrics and making sure that you understand 
what the business needs in terms of a service level and what you can deliver. And so that's what we spent a lot of time on in this last year. We're still spending some time on that for manufacturing because we have to adjust our numbers. But we have um, a good vision of where we want to go in terms of what we want to do for the organization over this next couple of years. Um, so I'm not going to spend any time on this because I already talked a little bit about our lessons learned along the way. They really fell into this four primary categories. When you take a look at anything, we didn't have enough resources. Who has enough resources for their stuff? Um, change management wasn't something that was done. We have a, right now we have an infrastructure change management board. We're starting to move that change management board into the application. So that's something that business technology and we will all share in the uh, improvements for that. Uh, we had a lot of environmental changes. Um, another thing that didn't have, that wasn't in place when they were, went to go implement the system is that they didn't have a, they didn't have a test system. So they had to go back and build a test system. <laughs> And, um, and then there wasn't a lot of testing. I'm used to coming from an environment when I was a service provider where when we had an enterprise um, identity access management system, we had about 2,500 to 3,000 tests that we had to run. Depending on what you were looking at, you would pull from those test sets to, to do your testing. We had about 200 tests in total, so that kind of corresponds with why we had some of the number of incidents that we had. We also didn't have a test system in place. We had paper-based systems, so I helped implement that um, before the end of uh, 2017. Um, where we are is we created a set of objectives. And I always, I'm not going to go into any detail on this. I just want to emphasize that these are listed in the order that I believe um, you would need to do this to accomplish it if you're wanting to get large-scale um, enterprise-wide services for identity management. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're going to do all of the first one once and you're going to make sure you've got 90% of it done before you go to objective two. Um, you're going to have to do some iterations through it, but as long as you keep your focus on, this, on, uh, like, on managing your identities first, and then pulling in your data from your application so that you know what people have access to, so that then you can do certification, and then you can do access requests because you have those connectors in place. Um, it makes your enterprise services a lot more robust, and you can um, have more impact to the organization. As, and as things come and go, then it's just adjusting connectors, it's adjusting services, et cetera. Um, this is our roadmap. This is aggressive, and I always say I, the ink doesn't dry before I'm asked to add something else that we need to accomplish because of our growth rate. So uh, we just bought and um, are building some, a manufacturing environment in China, so I'll be focusing on that this year. Um, like I said, so manufacturing is um, the mud-colored arm of this. <laughs> it's getting pulled in because I have to implement it sooner, so this is not quite correct. But I just wanted to give a focus on our program, created a strategy that created a set of objectives, and we took that and we we put that into a plan, and this comes direct out of Microsoft Project, and, um, and so that my operational services and the allocation that my operations team is, has to fulfill the needs that they do for their monthly releases also goes into this so that we can do the planning for the, extern the additional resources we may need to acquire to get, what we, um, to get some of these things accomplished. Um, in general, this is the message that we usually talk about from an identity perspective. It's an evolutionary program. It has significant benefit. Um, you want to make sure that you're protecting CSL assets. I'm part of the security organization, and so a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of the messaging that I do is that 
I'm trying to provide you a user experience improvement by giving you a simpler authentication experience, but at the same time, I'm doing this in a way that makes sure that what the data that you're accessing is protected. And, um, and then there's zero time for questions, but I will take some if you want to ask me. Thank you.